Hello. Um, thank you very much for everyone who made back from the break for this last session of day one of the International Plasma Protein Congress. My name is Evelina Kozubowska and I'm lead for um, European Regulatory Policy at PPTA. And I will take just a very short moment to introduce our next speaker and keynote, um, but as well as moderator of this session. So today morning, uh, Martin started this Congress by saying that it's only by standing on the shoulders of giants based on discoveries of past years, our member companies uh, continue to innovate and serve patients. I believe it's not an exaggeration to say that one more name could have been added to that list of this renewed people. So it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote and moderator of the session, John Curling. Throughout the case, John contributed to the extensive research on blood plasma protein purification, which formed the basis for the technology adopted by many manufacturers. I believe that the list of John's achievements is really long, but because we are limited in time, let me to mention a few. John established the first small modern chromatographic plasma fractionation facility at the National Plasma Fractionation Center in India in 1989. John Curling is also the author of numerous publications and was a contributor and editor of the book called Methods of Plasma Protein Fractionation. He was also co-editor and author of book uh, Production of Plasma Protein for Therapeutic Use, published in 2013. And currently, John Curlick is an independent consultant to the blood plasma uh, bioseparations and biotechnology, uh, biotechnology industries. Please join me by warmly welcoming John Curlick to the stage. Thank you, Evelina, and welcome to this session. It's uh, really good to see so many of you come back after coffee. And um, we will structure this session in the following way. I will give, uh, I was invited to give some ideas about what has happened in innovation and what is happening in innovation in the industry and in the production of blood plasma products. And then we have three uh, very specific um, discussion uh, about the availability, safety, and efficacy of uh, plasma products, uh, what has happened during COVID, and uh, plasma products for infectious diseases. And we will have, I'm sure, some questions about that. And then optimizing plasma use, because we have right now quite a lot of waste fractions to deal with. So um, I would like to start here um, simply because I met here when I was a young guy, I moved to Sweden in 1967 in the same year, I met a scientist called Arne Tiselius who was given a Nobel Prize for the work that he did in separation techniques. And he introduced plasmapheresis, uh, sorry, electrophoresis to separate plasma proteins. And he introduced the notations of alpha one, alpha two, beta, and gamma. And it's from there we have gamma globulin. And in a way, it's a shame that we lost it, but now we have IgG that we use all of the time. Um, so this was an introduction. This was in the late 30s. But um, we should acknowledge um, the foundation of a, um, plasma fractionation. Uh, that means ethanol fractionation. And we can welcome back um, Edwin J. Cohn to um, Lisbon and to a congress like this. Um, here, Cohn demonstrated, oops, um, he demonstrated, let me see where I can see things. He, um, he demonstrated plasmapheresis, and this he was doing with a senior member of the Griffiths family. Cohn was very much he, um, a sort of, he wanted to do things. He wanted to be in the lab, and he traveled extensively in Europe to, you um, to introduce plasma fractionation using ethanol. 
and he insisted that when one set up a plant here in Europe, then he was going to be there and see that everything worked the way he thought it would work. And so this is the beginning of technology transfer and something that we have to thank him for. Now, we're talking about making blood plasma products. We are making products from a very difficult material. And when we look around the world at fractionation and purification facilities, we think, okay, you put plasma in one end, you get a product out the other end. And we tend, to, I think, to forget about all of the things in between that made this possible and all of the innovations that went into making one of these products. And in this slide, I tried to illustrate, illustrate all of the things that a fractionator has to have at their disposal to make fractionation and purification work. And as I said, Cohen he, uh, was an academic. Um, he went to non-profit centers. And I think a lot of fractionation developed after the 40s because of his work and because of these two guys, Kistler and Nietzschemann, who gave, of course, their name to particularly making an, IV, an IgG product. And they were academics to begin with. And I think one point that I would like to make here in this group is the contribution from academia and the importance of the link between academia the non-profit sector and the profit sector. All of these have to contribute. So these two guys introduced iron exchange into the purification part of uh, making plasma products. They didn't have the right materials to do this with, but later on in the early 70s, Henrik Björling, who was head of fractionation and introduced me to this topic at Carby in Uppsala, now Octopharma, he, um, he adapted iron exchange chromatography to the removal of excess hemoglobin because we were using a lot of hemolyzed plasma at that point and also to the removal of hepatitis B virus. So these are important contributions. So just to reinforce this, I'd like to say that, yes, we talk about fractionators and we know what we mean, but fractionation provides, quite simply, intermediate products which need to be purified. And when Cohen and Onkley made um, their first IgG products, these were a fraction to product. And that's what I think, if I remember correctly, was used in the measles epidemic in Philadelphia at that time. I'm sure Thomas will have much more uh, detail about that. Anyway, you can see that from the 1950s, and particularly in the 1960s, that there has been a development of purification. And this is because all sorts of companies, not least of which the company that I used to work for in, in Uppsala in Sweden, introduced purification methods, which were based on molecular size or weight, on isoelectric point, on charge density, hydrophobicity, and all sorts of molecular properties, and not simply the five variables the cone had to work with. So you can see here that there is a development in fractionation and also a major development in purification. Now, who's contributed, contributed to all of these breakthroughs? And I would just give you a few examples. Cryoprecipitate was first described actually in a uh, in a thesis by Emile Remier from the University de Nancy, and it was unknown, I'm sure, to Judith Paul, who we all know worked on cryoprecipitate and provided us with um, a starting point for factor VIII. The Oxford Haemophilia Centre was another major centre 
driven by individuals, of course, particularly Rosemary Briggs and Ethel Bidwell, who developed ear PCC and later, of course, went on to develop Factor IX. For many years, I was in contact with the Central Laboratory of the Netherlands Red Cross, CLB. And what I recall is that um, there were a number of publications in Voxang which all addressed contributions to the optimal use of plasma. And one of the major products that they worked on and that we should be grateful for is C1 esterase inhibitor. And you know that this was developed in Amsterdam, and it's why there is a recombinant alternative that was also developed in the Netherlands. When we look at intravenous IgG, all of this starts because of the need to inject more material into patients who need it. And those of us who've received intramuscular IgG before we traveled, because it was supposed to prevent us from infection, know where it hurt and how it hurt. And it's a major step forward that Barandun initiated using a um, enzyme a degradation of um, the, um, the polymerase, polymers of IgG. So this is also an indication of the how things work between the universities, between the Red Cross uh, in, uh, in Bern. I also want to mention leukocyte interferon that was developed here by the Finnish Red Cross together with the Finnish uh, um, Public Health Institute and led by Kari Kantel. And why mention this? Because it shows the effect of collaboration and also it shows that this leukocyte interferon was actually a kind of precursor to the establishment of Biogen in Switzerland that made a, an interferon, an alpha interferon in cell culture. So this is one of the first places where we saw um, recombinant alternatives. When we think about hyperimmune IgGs, we, I think, need to acknowledge the work of Hoppe in Germany, because his work on anti-D developed a very simple method without using any ethanol whatsoever that formed the basis for CanGene in uh, Canada. Now that's emergent biosystems. Uh, and it's a simple ion exchange method. It uses two or three uh, purification steps and I think is potentially the basis for another process for particular immunoglobulins. We also have the development of haptoglobin in the bioproducts laboratory and a particular development of albumin, which I will come to in a minute. So um, these are the proteins or some of the proteins which are in development. And um, I will not go into this. You can see that the proteins have been around for a very long time. They've been isolated, um, particularly during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, because of the emergence of purification methods adapted to proteins. So um, I will leave this and um, Andrea will uh, go deeper into this. Well, innovation is attached to developing purity. It's attached to developing yield. And as you can see in this slide, the, oops, the recovery in the ethanol precipitation steps, if you go to one plus two plus three, or even worse, down to two, it's no more than 50 or 60 percent. That may have improved somewhat over the years. But then when we have introduced new purification methods like caprylate fractionation, PEG fractionation, and particularly anion exchange and cation exchange methods, these have very, very high recoveries. And so this is where a lot of innovation took place. And you can see this in purity. 
Um, BPL took a redissolved fraction of five paste, I think anecdotally, because they were receiving adverse event reports or complaints about the use of their albumin where recipients were getting a taste of aluminium in their mouths during infusion. And so they said, well, we need to do something about that. And so they introduced a, a step which made vast improvements in albumin. But we're not really there yet because we are still at a, um, a monomer content of 98%. So we still have 2% of proteins and some of them are illustrated here, alpha-2-HS and alpha-1-AG, uh, hemopexin and so on, uh, which tell us that we deal with impure proteins and we probably don't know quite enough about the proteins that we deal with. In everyday language we say, we talk about albumin, we talk about IVIG, thinking in a way that they're a little bit like pharmaceutical products, that they are pure that they are close to 100% or they are 100%. But that's not actually true. And yeah, we will look later in this afternoon on the importance of R&D. In terms of yield, this is quite a difficult subject because everybody has different ways of making products, even if it's based on ethanol fractionation and then different downstream processes. But making a change in a process is in this environment of the regulatory con constraints and the concerns of efficacy and purity of, uh, of the product and safety. So um, these guys, uh, Liebing and his colleagues, they worked under these um, premises that you should maintain the clinical properties and maintain the efficacy and so on. And you cannot change the trunk fractionation scheme. And that's really important because if you change it, then things happen. And we have an incident here <coughs> in Austria at one point where one thought one was making a minor change to a process but that didn't really happen. It was a major change and needed a lot of changes. But you can see, if you really dig into this, that you can make improvements. You can, in this case, get to a 70% um, shorter processing time. You reduce 15 steps to 10 and you increase the yield significantly and, importantly, the time in the plant. So this industry, has been inventive and innovative all of the time. And one of the interesting innovations, which hasn't actually progressed because it tackled just one part of a process, is continuous processing, which the biopharmaceutical industry is particularly interested in and is using to some extent. But this group at the SNVTS, they actually did use continuous small volume mixing that's of ethanol and the plasma feed, maintaining the right pH and ionic strength. And all of this was done in static mixers at very controlled speeds. So part of what the industry is dependent on is the innovation that the vendors make. Um, to separate um, precipitates from supernatants initially, we used Sharple centrifuges. Where were Sharple centrifuges used first of all? Of course, in the dairy industry. And so um, we borrowed that technology. But then you can see uh, on the bottom slide here, a completely new innovation in separating product streams and precipitates from supernatants, which was developed by GA together with one of the fractionators. Well, some of the vendors, like one of the vendors that I was associated with, we looked at using ion exchange chromatography and we actually managed to separate three fractions one of which was very rich in IgG, the other in very rich in albumin, and the third peak is actually ceruloplasmin. 
And so that's one way of making ceruloplasmin, and we will come to that as well. Um, so these uh, people outside of the industry, they are developing technologies, but it's up to uh, the industry to innovate and adapt these methods for biopharmaceutical application and for regulatory compliance. So product safety, of course, we've had innovation and uh, Thomas will certainly address this. But I think really one of the immense breakthroughs was the use of solvent detergent in activation, which was developed at the New York Blood Center by Bernie Horowitz and his colleagues. And this was, a, of course, in tackling a, lipid enveloped viruses, but not a, effective for non-lipid envelopes. And that came with the introduction of virus filtration or nanofiltration. Many thanks, I think, to one company um, in Japan who developed a hollow fiber technology to remove um, uh, non-enveloped viruses. So there's innovation as well in fractionation facilities. And one of them illustrated here is the way the Ukrainians used to have a plant, I think, Jan will correct me, but this is probably from sometime in the 60s. And then this is what they have today, thanks to consultants. And uh, it's a completely new piece of engineering. And in the bottom panel here, you can see how engineering of facilities has attempted and succeeded in separating basically people from the product because we are the greatest danger to the product. Now, there is disruptive innovation as well. And one example I give here, this was recently published, and this is using expanded bed technology instead of fixed bed chromatography. And you have a very much higher flow through of product, but you can see here that you still end up with a cascade of a number of steps which provide you with intermediates, all of which have to be purified by established purification methods. So when I look at the, uh, this kind of disruptive innovation, I find that although many have been developed they, there have been disappointing results uh, at fractionators who have not uh, adopted them. Many of these technologies have been in development for decades. And when something has been in development for 30 years or even 50 years in some cases, like electrophoresis, I begin to question why has this not succeeded? And what do we have to do to make it succeed? In, succeed and I'm not sure there is a way to do it. Um, often, and this is a kind of warning sign that um, such developers often make very heavy um, claims about purity and recovery from plasma. Uh, we had an example of this shown um, at a conference that I was at in November last year where somebody was claiming 90% recovery of uh, IgG from plasma and uh, it simply didn't add up. So uh, none of them really uh, go to the extent of demonstrating safety and efficacy and seem to have been unable to convince us. Well, to finish with, I would like to use this slide. Um, I think the industry has developed from being, let's say, industry focused. What we can do, we are, we have, we're focused on technology. This was a major breakthrough, a major step forward when um, Cohen uh, introduced uh, fractionation using ethanol. But I think we have arrived at a place where we are thinking a lot more about patient groups. 
And I use this slide, which is called The Tempest, because I think that anybody who is suffering a chronic disease or who has suffered an acute medical situation will realize or they know the tempest which is going on in their body. And it's up to us to provide the proteins that will ameliorate their condition. So I'll end with two innovators here that come from the uh, separations field, actually. Um, and the first is Arnie Tizalius, who says the fundamental problems in the chemistry of large molecules that we deal with are to a high degree dependent on the development of suitable and highly specific separation methods. And two, a uh, Sidney Brenner, who we have to thank for messenger RNA and the groundwork which has enabled the development of modern vaccines. He said in a lecture in Lausanne, progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries and new ideas, probably in that order. So that's a take home message from me. And thank you for listening to this presentation. And I would now like to introduce our first speaker. It is Thomas Kreil from Takeda. And Thomas has an immense reputation. He is speaking in just about every conference or congress or working party or steering group that deals with product ear safety, particularly with respect to ear viral safety. Thomas is the Vice President of Global Pathology Pathogen Safety at Takeda. He's also Chairman of PPTA's Pathogen Safety Steering Committee. He's a steering committee member of the Consortium on Ad Adventitious Agents. Uh, contamination in biomanufacturing because we are not the only area that has a problem. Uh, and he's also an associate professor at the Institute of Virology in Vienna. Uh, his work is so extensive that I will not uh, even touch it, but ask Thomas to come to the podium and give his presentation. Thank you, Thomas. Well, thank you, John. Um, hello, everybody. Um, this today is actually going to be a bit different in that, yes, I will talk about safety, but I think I'd like to connect three really important aspects of plasma-derived medicines, and that's availability, safety, and efficacy. They are really linked to one the other, and I think the industry at this stage faces an enormous change in all of the three of them. I, that's why I wanted to build this bridge amongst the three of them. So clearly, I think we can all agree that more plasma is indeed needed. The WHO has stated that uh, this is the minimum medicines that based on their proven cost efficacy profile should be available in all, um, in all countries, in the low and middle income countries too, which quite frankly, they are not today. And there are limitations today. The first one, the sourcing practices, and this quite frankly puzzles me in that the discussion here seems to focus more on whether donors are remunerated or not for their gift instead of focusing on the ultimate purpose of that gift, and that is to make more medicine available. Collaboration, therefore, I think, would be the timely solution to address this issue. The second one, and we have heard that a number of times, is the geographic imbalance of plasma collection. At this stage, I've heard that Europe depends 40% on plasma from the United States. But that, I think, falls short of the real issue in that also we need to think through what it means for the supply of low and middle income countries. It's not only Europe. And yes, there is initiatives to make Europe maybe more resilient. We've come to realize through COVID that that is something very necessary. But I think it needs to stretch beyond Europe. We need to make sure that all the jurisdictions around the world develop the capability of contributing and provide access to these important medicines. And the third limitation, I have a hard time even saying that, is safety measures. But I think we also need to acknowledge that the safety measures we have put in time some 10 or 20 years back for all the right reasons, now come into the way of effectively sourcing plasma and therefore should be revisited. 
Some of them are stuck in politics, and I think the restrictions on sexual practices because of HIV risks is something that we're all aware of, and I'll touch on that in a bit. The second thing is we need to acknowledge that science has come a long way, and so therefore the measures 20 years back made sense, but they do not now anymore that we have come so much closer to the heart of the issues and can address them otherwise. Now, the good thing there is, there is a lot of progress going on. I'm just making mention of a few initiatives here. They all try to do the very same thing, and that is make available more of safe and effective plasma drive therapies. Now, at this stage, the unfortunate thing is that many of these are activities with the results not so clear yet. So, I think there is as much opportunity as there is concern, and we heard details about that, so I'm not going to touch on that. UNITAR, I think, are very important initiatives uh, where some of the technology to address the questions around plasma supply is being addressed with these low middle income countries in hopes that they will establish infrastructure that will make available more plasma. And it's a really important initiative there. There's another one uh, on International Coalition for Safe Plasma Proteins. They're trying to do the very same thing. And now there is another European Commission funded project. Again, for now, it's activity not result, but it's certainly going in the right direction. <laughs> The good thing is that there is other results that are very clear. And I applaud our colleagues at Briffles who have shown that they are really willing to take on a totally new environment for plasma collection here, Egypt. And they have just recently announced that actually the first plasma shipments from this uh, Egyptian plasma will now be converted into plasma derivatives. Laudable many ways because that's not quite the safety concept that we were used to live with in the past, in that in Egypt, some 10% of the population carry hepatitis viruses. That's not exactly consistent with the PPTA viral marker rates. But to be honest, I think it is the perfectly right thing to do, and that the technologies, the concepts that we have brought forward or over time are perfectly capable of managing that plasma supply. So it's good that there is more. And how do we manage? Well, everybody in this audience know that that slide is in every one of my presentations. Because I think as an industry, we need to be really proud. So the blood systems have only the selections of healthy donors and the testing of the donations. Only that is meant to say the major contribution here to safety of plasma derivatives, they don't have access to. They don't have a manufacturing process with dedicated virus inactivation, virus removal steps. And they are quantitatively by far the most important contribution to the safety margins. The one thing that we're still missing a little bit is an appropriate differentiation in the regulatory context between blood products for transfusion and plasma for the manufacture of industry produced plasma derivatives. And there is progress there as well. I'll show you just that. Just to not badmouth the blood world and what they do for testing and uh, selection. I just recently had the pleasure of meeting the man here on the left he actually received the 2022 Nobel Prize for the discovery of hepatitis C virus. Just that virus discovery and therefore the implementation of testing of the blood supply is estimated having avoided some 3 million blood transfusion transmissions of hepatitis C virus. Can you imagine 3 million cases of hepatitis C virus? A brilliant man, really, a very enjoyable evening. Uh, to my right, uh, my esteemed Italian colleague, Lisa, and Johannes, he's the head of the viral safety section. You can imagine it was not only viral, a lot of virus discussions on that table. But then I will say, coming back to this, it is this virus reduction capacity in the manufacturing processes that make the difference for us. And I think this slide, much as I like it, has done a disservice to it, in that this slide here is actually put on a log scale. So one column is meant to represent 100 fold. So this is 100 fold. This is 100 by 100 by 100 by 100. This is 100 million fold. So suffice it to say the process is able to do a million fold more than the selection and the testing. And I think we have seen the fruit of that over time in that this concept of virus reduction has not been fully embedded and demanded by the way by regulations, but it has been copied by the other biologics industry. How that? So all the risk is accumulated here in the plasma manufacturing pool. And then we separate that risk from the product or the patient rather, 
by the introduction of reduction steps in the manufacturing process. And that same concept of segregating or separating the risk has been applied for recombinant proteins in that all the risk that goes into the manufacturing is associated with the raw materials that may have rodent droppings that contain mouse parvoviruses for which we have seen 20 contamination events in the biotech that has potentially wiped out supply of some of the rare treatments for two years. So that is why our regulations stipulate that the reduction needs to separate that risk from the final product. And it can be downstream, so during the purification from the fermenter feed, but it can also be embedded upstream. So before things even go into the fermenter, because there any virus can actually replicate in the cells that produce the product there. Now it goes further than that. Now the medicine gets really excited about these advanced therapy medicinal products, ETMPs cell therapies, but you cannot run a cell therapy through a virus inactivation state. There won't be any therapeutic efficacy left. And that's why for these products, there is exclusively the option to implement these upstream viral barriers. But the concept is exactly the same as we've done for plasma. We've just now published this actually with this MIT consortium, because I can tell you one of the plasma companies is very actively advocating for the implementation of these measures that have so well been proven in the plasma world. Now there is progress, as I said earlier, uh, on the political as much as on the science arena, and this is on the politics. The Australian TGE has just announced that they are willing to allow the removal of any questions about sexual preferences from the collection of plasma, which is great because that plasma is then anyway manufactured and virus reduced. So you shouldn't worry about minimal difference in sexual exposure that leads to really painful questions. And there is now this what they call the plasma pathway where that might not be possible for plasma. You would still have to do that for blood because they don't have the manufacturing process. The big remaining question is, while this is the exact right thing to do, it begs the question of how much that is going to be harmonized, how much all the other jurisdictions will be willing to adopt that same process. And otherwise, it's just going to generate a logistics nightmare for the plasma products, because plasma is very global. The same thing for this. Now, this is an advancement of the science. 20 years back, when we didn't even know what caused BSC and then the man-made human disease variant CGD, it was the right thing following the precautionary principle to disallow the use of British plasma. But those times are over. Now we perfectly well understand what it is, how it can be managed. We see the epidemiology therefore reflect our intentions. And therefore now, it has been appreciated that the risk of variant CJD is negligible, particularly where the clinical need for immunoglobulins was overwhelming, and therefore this has changed. Now it has changed in Ireland, the UK, Australia, the US, and hopefully soon in Europe. But it has not changed, for example, in China, which is a major consumer of albumin. So again, it begs this question about harmonization. And if you're not successful there, then longer term, to be honest, all these advantages will not bear fruit for us. Now, talking about um, the next issue that we're going to have, and China, well, that's where COVID came from, and maybe that's where others will come from too. This is not meant to badmouth China at all. I mean, to be honest, this investigation is a wonderful investigation in that they have checked with a very advanced methodology for the cross-species transmission of all sorts of viruses. And yes, there is concern. Circoviruses, for example, are extremely small. They don't carry a lipid envelope. They would be the maximum challenge for our processes. And is that going to be confined to China or not? I rather doubt it. There is this global village thing that was coined around economics, but in reality, it is a very global village. In Austria, my home country, we receive north of 700,000 Chinese guests a year. That's a tenth of our population. On top of that, there is Chinese plasma fractionators who collect plasma in China, but then have registrations in countries around the world and do export it there. So to assume that what happens in China, really do I worry? That's a bad approach. We absolutely need to worry. We almost need to remain vigilant because everything is just a few flight hours away from us. And much as we think we know so many things about the viruses around us, I think it is ignorant to believe that that is putting us in a better position. 
So this picture is taken from a review that was published in 2017. And at that stage, monkeypox was mentioned twice. And still, over the last year, we have gone through an epidemic of monkeypox in around 100 countries in the world, with some 90,000 cases and more than 100 people dead. So ignorance, assuming we have figured it out, is the wrong posture to take. The good thing is we know what it takes for our product. So long as the manufacturing process with inactivation and removal works, we're in a good place. And that's what over time we have confirmed with many of these emerging viruses and yet sure again for MPOX2. And all of these have led to a differentiation in some ways in that for the blood world, oftentimes tests for these newly emerging viruses have been demanded, yet still we have seen virus transmissions. For the plasma world, this has not been required and based on the reduction capacity, there has not been any transmissions. That's the kind of differentiation that we need in the regulatory landscape. That's the best illustration how these product lines are clearly different. Now, switching gears to the last, efficacy. Uh, Martin has stolen the thunder pretty much of what I'm was going to say because, yes, Antibodies from initially animal hosts have been used for a very long time as medical intervention. The first Nobel Prize to Emil von Behring and then to Paul Ehrlich when he was able to quantify the potency of these serum. Because at that stage, these gentlemen did not know that was in that serum was antibodies that could neutralize a virus or a bacterial toxin. Cohn didn't know that either, but he was able to purify certain fractions of protein. And then there was a courageous medical doctor who had a patient with recurring infections with an absent gamma globulin band in the serum electrophoresis. And he just took the gamma globulin and stuck it into that person. And the person did better. That's a kind of an MD approach. And so long as it works, really, so long as your patient is better, do I need to care what the molecules are? Cohn, I'm sure, as well as Bruton, didn't know that it was antibodies we were looking for. Now, antibodies, I think, is something that needs to be researched a lot more because antibodies is the volume driver for this entire industry. It's the gamma globulins. And I think we need to acknowledge that it makes a difference of what our plasma donors have gone through before they donate. Have they met the virus? Have they been vaccinated against it? What's the incidence of any virus in any population where we collect? And that's very different around the world, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we need to stop being ignorant about that. Particularly now, they'll be going into different geographies and therefore the antibody spectrum, I can tell you, will profoundly change again. And the antibody spectrum is not stable over time. Just to use one, and John mentioned, yes, indeed, measles was treated by administration of Ig, but that's a long time back. And measles antibody levels have changed profoundly in that introduction of vaccination has brought down these antibody levels and that infection is more potent than vaccination. And that's a clinically meaningful readout. We have seen the same thing the other direction around and Todd is going to share more information there with COVID-19. Initially, zero antibodies that neutralized that new virus in our IGs. After more and more donors had COVID, it came up. After everybody has been vaccinated, now it's super potent. And even some of the variants are by now super well covered. So initially, the virus did have the upper hand, the IG didn't do much, but that has changed. And those changes are something that we need to understand. That's something that our stakeholders have started to acknowledge. Charlotte Cunningham Rundles, she's a legend in the field of immune deficiencies, and she wrote that, looking back a decades of challenges, she says, after pandemic COVID-19, it's understood that we need to better understand which antibodies are in our products. And to be honest, the FDA's Code of Federal Regulation still focuses on measles, polio, and diphtheria. A bad anachronism because polio doesn't exist anywhere in the world and measles numbers are like this. We had a workshop driven by PPTA with the FDA to tell them there is clinically more meaningful agents such as adenovirus, respiratory virus, or human parainfluenza that has not gone anywhere. Apparently changing the Code of Federal Regulations is as difficult as changing the Ten Commandments. Now, with that, I'd like to summarize. This industry is up against a formidable challenge. We know that our products are phenomenal, only we cannot provide it to all the patients in the quantities that they need. So that is something that we need to work on, and it will require opening up more geographies. That will bring challenges in that different pathogens will be in circulation, safely. 
Different antibodies will be formed, therefore, and that's about efficacy. On safety, I think the concepts are super mature. We should be proud that we have taught the biologics industry how to keep products safe. On emerging agents, to be honest, complacency, never. It's not a question uh, of if, but it's a question of when we're going to have the next agent. So we need to verify that our processes are safe. And then on the efficacy of our volume driver, I think it's about time we get more serious to do more research there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Thomas. We will come back to, to this with a number of uh, questions um, at the end of the session. And uh, so I would like to continue with introducing Dr. Todd Willis, who is Senior Vice President of Plasma R&D within the Scientific Innovation Office of Griffiths. Um, well known. Todd has 30 years of industrial experience within diagnostics and biosciences, developing point of care diagnostic test reagents and plasma derived protein therapeutics. And he received his PhD in biochemistry from the Colorado State University. He's currently based at RTP. Todd. So thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here. And today I'm going to talk about plasma-derived therapies for infectious diseases and some of the challenges that we have developing one of these. The infectious disease is COVID. However, the challenges that we're experiencing also applies to other infectious diseases, particularly those pathogens that change structure, that mutate. Because with them, you have unique challenges. And if we can overcome those, we can develop quicker and better therapies. Quick disclosure statement. Plasma-based therapies for treating infectious diseases. There are a lot of them. The reason is because convalescent plasma is the fastest antibody-based therapy for treating infectious diseases. It contains the antibodies capable of neutralizing pathogens. And we heard a little bit earlier today about Emil von Behring, about what he did for scarlet fever for, for the Spanish flu but it was actually doing development back in the 1800s. In 1891, he developed a serotherapy for diphtheria, tetanus. So his foundation, the father of serotherapy, really set the, ground, the groundwork for developing a lot of different plasma-based therapies. And the therapies range from the passive transfer convalescent plasma to concentrated hyperimmunes. And the treatments can be pre and post exposure prophylaxis, they can be with or without symptoms, very broad treatment. And some of these are highly, highly efficacious. Something like rabies, when the rabies hyperimmune is coupled with a vaccine, it is very capable at stopping the, the spread of the virus and the cause of rabies, the disease. But what happened with COVID-19? There were many, many clinical studies during the pandemic and when you go through the results and you looked at the randomized controlled, the good studies, what you found is a lot of negative results. But in the February timeframe of 2021, a group came out with a double blind placebo controlled study, and they were able to demonstrate a reduced progression of COVID-19 with antibody intervention. What they were using was convalescent plasma. And this Argentinian group, they focused on three criteria. One of them was to use a high titer convalescent plasma. The higher the titer, the more efficacious it was. The other is early administration. What they were looking for is within 72 hours of symptom onset to try to capture the disease, the infection, when the virus was spreading. The third was to identify susceptible patient population, older adults, people with primary or secondary immunosuppression. So what I'm going to be talking about today, it's called OTAC. It's a clinical study that Griffles is involved with, the outpatient treatment with anti-coronavirus immunoglobin. And the scientific rationale are fairly similar to what we saw in the Lipster trial. The first is that we want to focus on the early course of the infection prior to the antibody response when viral replication is extensive. Second is we believe that a hyperimmune intravenous globulin may have advantages over convalescent plasma, may have advantages over monoclonal antibodies because we can develop a high neutralizing titer product with the potential for broad and durable antiviral activity 
against a spectrum of mutations that the virus may present, against the different variants of concern that Omicron, for example, um, presents. So the greatest treatment benefit also is at-risk population. These are the people with weakened immune system. So the study is here. So we have two groups. It's a placebo-controlled group. We have, an, we have a drug study group with the um, hyperimmune, the anti-SARS-CoV-2, HIVIG, with or without standard of care. Whatever that standard of care is, the placebo group plus or minus standard of care. The po patient population, the age, people 55 years or older, or adults with weakened immune system, or on immunosuppressants. So that's our patient population that we're targeting in on. And then also, it's very important to get early into that infection um, time frame, get into the viremic state. So what we're looking for is within five days of a positive test or with symptom onset. Not 72 hours, we broaden it out to five days. And no hospitalization is required, so this is an outpatient study. The product is shown here. It's an anti-COVID-19, hyperimmune. We call it anti-COVID HIVIG. It's a 10% product, 100 milligrams per mil. And we believe it's an improvement, an improvement over convalescent plasma because it's well-defined. And there are many reasons. It has a broad antibody diversity because we create these large pools of convalescent plasma. It has greater product consistency. So what we're able to do is look at the titer to um, SARS-CoV-2 of each of the nation donations and make sure that the donations that are going there have such a titer and then they're normalized by pooling these together. The other thing is the higher antibody concentration, where in convalescent plasma, you may have an antibody concentration of 10 milligrams per mil. This is 10 percent, 100 milligrams per mil, so a higher antibody neutralization potential. Reduce risk events and eliminate the need for blood matching. Greater pathogen um, safety profile, just like Thomas was talking about, dedicated virus clearance steps in the purification process of this product. Antibody specificity is defined by the current donor population with the potential to adapt to the virus. So as new infections occur and you're collecting plasma from those people are getting infected, you have the potential for your product to adapt with the virus. And improve product storage. Instead of convalescent plasma at minus 30 degrees, we have a product storage at 2 to 8 degrees. Okay, so how do we go about doing this? In 2020, we had large plasma collection campaigns. And the collection was for convalescent plasma. So these were people who were infected in 2020, they're infected primarily by the ancestral strain. So this is the pre-vaccine era. And we did the collection, we did all of the infectious disease testing, but we also implemented the antibody titer testing for SARS-CoV-2. We needed to know what we were working with. And then we used in Griffles a platform for Gaminex, where we take the two plus three paste, that is IgG rich, we do the purification to purify our IgG to make the finished product. So this was in 2020, the plasma that we collected in 2020. So that was plasma from convalesced patients. They were healthy individuals, convalesced from the disease, and our product was HIVIG, and I have in parentheses convalescent plasma. All right, 2020. And then what happened? So the first patient in the United States was in... Um, what, January of 2020. He was a visitor. Um, he was visiting... Wuhan at the time, he came to the United States, he was in Washington, our, our, our patient number one, January 2020. By the end of 2020, December, we already had a vaccine. When you have a vaccine that's coming into the population, there's a huge change in the plasma. And so in 2020 collection, it was convalescent plasma only. In 2021, now we're able to collect convalescent plasma from patients that have also been vaccinated so that was our new hybrid approach. So we collected plasma, again, convalescent plasma plus vaccination. Again, healthy individuals, but these individuals, they were convalesced, they received the vaccine. When you receive the vaccine, you have an exponential increase in the antibody titer. So you can, you can have the potential to create something at a much, much higher activity towards SARS-CoV-2. And the product here is HIV, it's convalescent plasma plus vaccination. Okay, so two products, convalescent plasma, second product, hybrid, convalescent plasma plus vaccination. Another important thing is that when you have a project like this, you're trying to develop 
a therapeutic for infectious diseases, you need a good activity assay, a potency assay. And we're very fortunate to have a collaboration with the Integrated Research Facility, which is part of National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And we use their neutralization activity assay. So live virus neutralization activity. It's published here if you're interested in it. And you get a live virus neutralization curve like this, where at high antibody concentration or at low dilution, you can neutralize 100% of the virus. You inhibit the virus from being able to infect a cell. As you decrease the antibody concentration, you increase the dilution. You decrease the ability for the antibody to inhibit the virus, and so your neutralization activity goes down to zero. And so this was initially developed for the ancestral strain, the Wuhan strain, but now we've been able to adapt it to other variants of concern. And then there's another important measure, it's called the IC50, this half maximal inhibitory concentration, which is shown by that horizontal dashed line. And it's just the antibody concentration that achieves 50% neutralization. And it allows you to normalize with standards or with controls, so you can look at the IC50 and express antibody activity in neutralization activity. And you can express it in all types of units, international units, if you stand it against an international standard. In-house, we have something called, and it, it's an arbitrary, it, it's, a, it's a plasma material, and we get something called an arbitrary unit per mil, so AUs per mil. And in this discussion, I'm just gonna talk about activity in terms of AUs per mil. So the neutralization activity is very different depending upon what that source of plasma is. Again, convalesce patients only or donors, or donors convalesced and vaccinated. And you can see the striking difference between the two curves on this live virus neutralization assay. And so we brought in a term neutralization capacity because we have two different products. And it's a measure of the amount of neutralization activity administered to the patient. Okay, it's going to be very important, particularly when you have two different products with substantially different activities. So if we look at the neutralization capacity of this product made with convalescent plasma, it has an activity of about 650 arbitrary units per mil. And the dose volume that we were giving in the clinical trial was 300 mil. So if you take the multiplier 650 times 300, you get an idea of what the neutralization capacity was, and it was approximately 200,000 AUs. But it's much different when you start to look at the hybrid product, the convalescent plus vaccinated. This activity of this product was around 41,000 AUs per mil, much higher. Because it was so much higher, we decreased the volume. But even by decreasing volume, when you still take the activity times the volume that we were using in the clinical trial at 35 milliliters, the total neutralization capacity that we were giving was about 1.4 million AUs per patient. So very different. This is the, the, the one of the greatest challenges. So everything that I've talked about so far is within, it's with the ancestral strain, with Wuhan. But what do we know about SARS-CoV-2? What do we know about influenza, RSV? There's a continuous evolution. SARS-CoV continuously evolved. And then if you look at this insert, it's the, some of the Omicron variants where in the BA5 dominated in 2022. The XBB started appearing at the end of 2022, and the XBB.1.5, at least in the United States, is dominating today. And now we're starting to see the emergence of XBB.1.16, and it's believed that in the fall time frame, it'll be the primary variant of concern in the United States. And during this evolution, you saw and heard all of these monoclonal antibodies being developed, and they were just being dropped off. The XBB dropped off the last monoclonal antibody where that monoclonal antibody was no longer capable of neutralizing that lineage of, 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 of SARS-CoV-2. So what does a live virus neutralization activity assay, because it's so critical in these type of tests, look like with these new variants of concern? The first thing that you see is you see this shift to the left. And as it shifts to the left, that means you have to use a lower dilution or a higher antibody concentration to achieve that 50% neutralization, to achieve that IC50. The other thing that you see is that if you look at the BQ.1.1 and the XBB, you see quite a bit of loss of the activity, the neutralization activity with these new variants. Again, this measurement here was done with the hyperimmune made with convalescent plasma plus vaccination. 
But the thing is, is that it was still able to neutralize these new variants. So we talked about a broad and durable antiviral activity. It was still able to neutralize. And what's also is amazing is that this product, this convalescent plus vaccination, this was all pre-Omicron. The infections were with ancestral strain. The vaccine for this material was ancestral strain, so pre-Omicron, and it still was able to have a broad antiviral activity. The other thing to think about is that what happens if we make new product? What happens if we get new donors? What happens if we get a more contemporary vaccine, a more contemporary vaccine that may be a bivalent with an Omicron portion to that vaccine? And so the hope is that by doing that, you're able to recover some of the neutralization activity that you lost as the virus mutates. But again, I want to reemphasize that, the, that this hyperimmune still demonstrated broad antiviral activity against these novel mutations and variants of concern. So this leads to the next concept. We talked about neutralization capacity. We talked about mutations. We talked about when that neutralization capacity is lost, what do you do? The next concept is adjusting the dose volume. Can you adjust the dose volume to provide an equivalent neutralization capacity for different circulating variants? And the concept is simple. If you have a lot of antibody titer towards that volume, towards that variant, you can reduce the volume. If you have less antibody towards that variant, you have to increase the, the volume. So a flexible dose stash strategy was established to, um, for equivalent neutralization capacity, and that was based on a threshold of 200,000 absorbent units. And if we look at an example of what it would take if we were to meet this threshold of 2,000 um, AUs, what it would take, and we were doing it with 300 milliliters of the convalescent plasma hyperimmune, but if we were gonna treat XBB, it would have taken 3,000. But we also had this other hybrid product. We were initially doing, um, uh, infusing 35 milliliters. However, we can still maintain neutralization, this threshold of 200,000, by uh, infusing anywhere from 200 to 300 mils for the XBB and XBB.1.5 strain. So we have the neutralization capacity threshold of 200,000, and we have this higher potency product that allows a lower dose volume, very important in the study. So in summary, convalescent plasma provides a broad and durable pathogen activity, but you have to look at considerations, timing from exposure, antibody titer, and the target patient population to achieve the greatest therapeutic benefit. A hyperimmune does have potential advantages over convalescent plasma, broader antibody diversity, product consistency, increased antibody activity, and a safer profile. And then if you can couple convalescent plasma with vaccination, you can generate significantly higher antibody neutralization titers, which reduces the effective volume that you need in each dose. And then as the virus mutates and you understand, understand the neutralization, it may be necessary to achieve a desired neutralization capacity. And then with a flexible dosing strategy, you can maintain an equivalent neutralization capacity even when new variants occur. And then hopefully as we um, uh, manufacture hyperimmunes, and we are using more contemporary people um, who have more recent infections of different variants when we have more contemporary vaccines, we'll have something that is able to regain any loss in the neutralization capacity. So I do wanna give some thanks. This is um, a study that has required a high, high level of collaboration. Um, the OTAC study was sponsored by University of Minnesota. We had a collaboration of a clinical group, the International Network for Strategic Initiatives and Global HIV Trials. It was funded and technical support was provided by NIH through the um, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease and through a contract from Laetus Biomedical. Thank you. Thank you very much, Todd. A lot of fantastic and fascinating investigations. Um, I'd like to continue by introducing Andrea Caricasole, who is the Global Director of Research and Innovation at Kedrion Biopharma, and he is responsible for new product discovery and early development activities. Um, besides being a molecular and cell biologist by training, he has degrees from the UCL in the UK and from the University of Oxford. And he, um, he is going to 
lead us into the future. Andrea. Hmm. Thank you very much, John. I would like to thank the organizers as well for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure, honor to be presenting in this very distinguished panel. So we're going to move away from immunoglobulins and uh, start looking into the remaining 4,000 odd proteins which are present in our plasma, in the plasma that we actually uh, mani uh, process and from which we produce uh, our products. The, uh, what I will do today, I will uh, uh, take you through a, a short journey about the complexity of plasma and then show you one example of perhaps a low-hanging fruit which we can actually pick in order to optimize the use of this plasma and perhaps uh, develop novel therapies, particularly for uh, rare diseases. So this is the standard identity card of the proteins present in plasma, or the plasma proteome. It's a really interesting uh, ID card, I think, because first of all, it shows you the complexity of the plasma proteome. And if you're curious, you can go to the Human Protein Atlas and look up the uh, quantifications for over 4,000 individual proteins present in, in, uh, in plasma. The second aspect which is interesting is that the majority of these proteins, as you can see in this diagram which I tried to summarize, are deep, deep sea fish, essentially. So they are proteins which are present in very low quantities in the plasma, and they are incredibly complex. So the majority of this complexity is, is actually in this 1% of, uh, of the total content, protein content of, of plasma. And the other interesting aspect about this uh, ID card is, the fact, is that it is bidimensional. It provides information about the nature the identity of the proteins present in the plasma and the levels of the proteins present in plasma. But to touch again on a point which was mentioned previously by Dr. Crail, for instance, the, each protein has a multi-dimensional space in reality. It's not just the protein identity, it's also the, uh, obviously the protein levels, but also a number of other features of, uh, of the proteins, which include post-translational modifications, such as phosphorylation, acetylation, methylation, glycosylation, lipidation, and I could go on for, I think there's over 25 or 30 PTMs currently and, uh, characterized. Polymorphisms are important because the plasma that we collect comes from individual donors. And each one of us is genetically different. So we have in our own genome, and therefore in the proteome that we express, particularly in the plasma proteome, variations which may actually affect the way a particular disease, in the case of an absence of a protein, for instance, uh, ha the kind of onset it has and the progression that it may have. So I think the multidimensional space of the proteins, including our own products, is an aspect which we can do more to characterize and study and perhaps also to differentiate some of our products from uh, recombinant products. And nature has done a wonderful job because in the course of uh, evolution, eons of evolution has designed through uh, 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 really a, a quite robust selection process has designed over 4,000 proteins, as I've shown you earlier, in order to fulfill a number of specific biological roles in our body. So nature has designed the answers in, uh, uh, in plasma, in the proteins present in plasma, to actually enable us to address some of the diseases where, for instance, these proteins are actually missing. And protein replacement therapies form a cornerstone of our industry. And in fact, the plasma-derived industry is one of the cradles for the development of protein replacement therapies, particularly for rare diseases. Understanding the, uh, the, the overlaps between, for instance, the plasma proteome and the uh, proteome of rare diseases. So this is the, these are the proteins that are associated with uh, rare diseases. In many cases, the protein is actually missing. So the gene is dysfunctional, doesn't produce a functional protein. And they can be addressed by a protein replacement approach. If you look at the number of, pro of uh, therapeutics which are currently developed from plasma, you can see that there is an enormous potential 
opportunity and clearly there are caveats in using uh, the uh, uh, underbelly of the iceberg that I'm indicating here. Some of these caveats I will try to, to address during my presentation. So this is just to reinforce the concept. Uh, the opportunities essentially lie in the least abundant proteins, which are the most complex part of the uh, uh, human plasma protein. But you can see here uh, a non-exhaustive list, I should say, of the products that have actually been uh, licensed for use in patients so far. And they all belong to the, uh, let's say, to the medium to high abundance range in terms of concentrations. So again, most of the opportunities lie in the low, low abundance uh, uh, range of concentrations. Now, what clearly there is an issue with, uh, particularly with the, can, the, stand, the current fractionation uh, technology to isolate and purify proteins, particularly the least abundant proteins. The issues are essentially being able to pull them out of, the pla of, of plasma. There are some solutions. One example being, for instance, the, IPPS, the PPPS uh, platform, the plasma protein purification platform, which I will acknowledge John for being one of the uh, authors on the original uh, patent. This is a, a methodology based on affinity chromatography. So we basically identify a ligand for the protein that we are interested in and use that ligand bound to a matrix to purify the protein of interest from plasma. And uh, uh, by doing that, you can actually uh, purify several, sequentially several proteins uh, from, from the same liter of plasma, if you want, by using different ligands for different proteins. So it's actually quite an efficient method as well because it will allow you to purify from the same plasma several different, uh, several different proteins. And uh, just an example of, of a success story in terms of the uh, technology, the uh, um, plasma-derived plasminogen, the, only, the first in class product for uh, uh, plasminogen deficiency type one is actually produced using this methodology. So it's one of the examples of uh, let's say, a novel uh, technology which uh, has actually met with success by going, go, going to the market. Now, the other aspect which is important, I think, for, uh, uh, as a caveat to, to uh, illustrate in terms of purifying some of the least abundant proteins, perhaps, is the fact that we'll take away the raw material, plasma, from, uh, uh, from the production of other products highly needed in terms of a me medical need and with a large demand, such as, for instance, immunoglobulins, which we heard a lot about in the past uh, couple of talks. Now, you could actually, if you could purify the protein of interest from uh, uh, some of the, let's call them byproducts. In many cases, these are unused intermediates during the fractionation process. I really simplify the fractionation process here just to highlight the fact that we, uh, in the course of producing the, the uh, particular staple products, but also other products, we generate a quantity of uh, unused byproducts or intermediates. And these intermediates could, be, could actually form the source for uh, novel potential protein replacement therapies. We need to know what's in there in these intermediates, and that is the basis, essentially, of what I'm going to present today. So uh, the idea, the concept, is to actually shift from uh, an use of uh, byproduct intermediates, which is opportunistic. So we are interested in a protein. Let's see where it is. Maybe it's in uh, fraction one, maybe it's fraction three, it's fraction four, and then purify from that fraction from more systematic use of these byproducts. So understanding the proteome of these byproducts, and then identify what proteins are in there prioritize targets, and then purify these products from the byproduct intermediates or unusing intermediates, if you want. And clearly, there are several uh, uh, positive aspects associated with this train of thought. The first is obviously ethical, because we will optimize the use of plasma, which is, as we all know, a very scarce and precious resource uh, from uh, donations. The uh, possibility of developing novel therapies there is also a business, uh, let's say, element to it, which will enable to actually maximize, optimize the development uh, of uh, uh, therapies, particularly for our diseases, by lowering costs because they're using a waste product or an unused intermediate. And you know, you could also throw in as a as a positive byproduct of this kind of approach, 
You could also throw in the fact that you're reducing the industrial waste that you generated. Often this industrial waste has to be disposed as special waste. So it's costly, it's a waste of uh, uh, plasma products. Now, obviously, these are some of the caveats that need to be addressed if you're interested in purifying a protein from uh, uh, an unused intermediate, let's say. First of all, the protein needs to be in there, obviously, but you will know that from the protein. The protein concentration needs to be sufficient, so you're likely to identify proteins which are uh, not necessarily only in the uh, rare or to medium, but maybe also in the high abundance uh, uh, sector. The protein activity, most importantly, these are byproducts, so it's possible that the protein that you're interested in, in a byproduct, for instance, is not active because it's been processed and therefore it may have lost activity. Then there is a question about isoforms, possibility of contaminants and the like. So what uh, we have tried to do is to characterize several uh, unused intermediates from uh, the fractionation process of one of our manufacturing plants. And then we've gone through this process of identifying potential candidates. And I'll show you some, uh, one example today of one protein which we have actually taken to proof of concept in animal studies. So this is the process essentially. We started with uh, 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 the, our uh, unused intermediates from the fractionation process. These, in terms of nomenclature, will be familiar to many of you. For us, it's uh, fraction one, fraction three, and fraction uh, 414. And this is the event diagram of the proteome identified in each fraction, highlighting uh, a total number of over 300 proteins, many of which are specific for one particular fraction, as you can see here, many of which are present in more than one fraction, and some, quite a significant component, are actually present in all three fractions. Now, this uh, proteome has gone through, and this we've done in collaboration with uh, uh, a foundation which is uh, uh, um, highly experienced in proteomic studies. Uh, we've taken this uh, proteome, we put it through a filter of bioinformatics and data mining characterization. The aim was obviously to uh, make sure we understood exactly what proteins were in there in terms of expression, function, identity, but also to address, uh, to, to identify association with disease, for instance, the availability of animal disease models, which is obviously key in order to uh, validate your protein replacement uh, therapy approach uh, preclinically, the availability of tools such as antibodies, and then we prioritized, you can read this, but you will, we submitted a manuscript, and so the, all this will be in print, hopefully in the next few months, you'll be able to read about it, and we prioritized these 300 proteins into something like 44 proteins which are actually associated to human disease and constitute potential candidate therapeutics mostly for rare diseases, but not only. Now, what did we find in there? I was kind of expecting to find generally abundant proteins, but that was not true. We also find proteins which are present in the low abundance, sort of nanogram uh, per liter type of concentration uh, range, as well as medium abundant proteins and uh, high abundance proteins. Clearly, we found the whole range, well, essentially most of the proteins that were currently licensed as, uh, as, uh, as products, and question, you know, maybe these uh, unused intermediates also provide opportunity, an opportunity to uh, purify further, to, uh, to increase yields for certain products by purifying, as an example, albumin or immunoglobulin also from these fractions. This is just a thought. Now, one example which I will conclude my uh, uh, talk with uh, of the proteins that we identified and prioritized is actually not, a, as John pointed out, not a particularly new protein to the field is uh, ceruloplasmin. A plasma-derived version of ceruloplasmin has been shown to be efficacious, for instance, in uh, addressing aspects of neurodegeneration in, uh, uh, in different disease models. But we thought that this would be a good test case to demonstrate that you can purify a protein from uh, uh, one of our news intermediates and demonstrate its activity preclinically, proof of efficacy in uh, an animal disease model because of the existence of uh, precedented data on the protein purified from plasma. And 
frankly, because this is a very interesting disease. A ceruloplasminemia is actually a neurodegenerative disease. It belongs to the uh, um, uh, neurodegeneration in brain iron accumulation diseases. Ceruloplasmin is, a, is an enzyme. It catalyzes the conversion of uh, iron into an, an ion form that can be transported it's not toxic, it can be transported by transferring to various sites around the body. And if you don't have ceruloplasmin, you have brain, uh, you have iron deposits in several organs, including the brain. In the brain, it causes a progressive and severe neurodegeneration. So these patients have a, a, a very dire time in, uh, uh, in their life because eventually they, they die from, from the neurodegenerative condition. This is not bleeding, this is a prolonged agony uh, caused by progressive neurodegeneration. It's an ultra-rare disease, so the lack of the protein is an ultra-rare disease. And, uh, but it's also interestingly linked to other diseases where ceruloplasmin levels are low, where you have brain iron deposition, where you have neurodegeneration certain uh, components of Parkinson's disease, as an example. And obviously, as with all rare diseases, the, uh, the diagnosis uh, is an important uh, aspect. So many of these patients have long patient journeys lasting several years. They remain misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed for a long or non-diagnosed for a long period of time. And by the time the actual uh, diagnosis is made, the patient is in a, in a clinically very very uh, overt uh, context. So the concept was, can we actually reproduce and extend, because we've also extended the published findings on the efficacy of ceruloplasmin in, uh, uh, in the aceruloplasminemia model, using the ceruloplasmin that we purified from uh, an unused intermediate. So we took an animal model of ceruloplasminemia, so the disease is associated with a lack of ceruloplasmin. You can take the knockout model, this is a mouse that does not have ceruloplasmin, and has a range of phenotypes, in a, uh, particularly in a number of uh, organs which are relevant to the human disease, such as the brain, brain iron accumulation, evidence of neurodegeneration, evidence of neurological impairment. I shall show you how we can actually measure neurological impairment in mice but also uh, dysfunctional erythropoiesis and uh, um, uh, steatosis in the liver, so inflammation in the liver associated with iron deposition in the same organ. And what we did is we took the ceruloplasmin from the unused intermediate, we call it cadian ceruloplasmin, and we demonstrated that treatment, as indicated here in these uh, aceruloplasminemic mice, results in a very robust uh, mitigation of the phenotype. You can see here, this is a principal component analysis. Each dot here is one of the phenotypes that we measured. You can see that the wild type mouse here in uh, uh, blue is very different from the knockout mouse here in red. And the treatment with the ceruloplasmin uh, actually shifts the phenotype of the knockout mice, the overall phenotype of the knockout mice, towards the wild type mouse, providing evidence of efficacy. Now, uh, focusing on the neurodegenerative aspect of the disease, which is the one which is particularly nasty in the case of the human disease, we looked at uh, both at the uh, neurological uh, profile of the mice. These mice have a, a very bad motor impairment, so they, they will, uh, when the onset of the disease uh, kicks in, they will not be able to coordinate their movements. As an example, this is a, called a rotarot test, it's a rotating rod, you place the mice on the rod, and the wild type mouse will be able to handle that, so it will run on the rod as the rod is moving to stand still. The mutant mouse will fall off, they can't keep up with the rotating rod. With the treatment, we end up with a situation which is essentially identical to the uh, situation we see in the mice. And the same reversion of the phenotype we observe with other uh, motor coordination tests, which I don't have the time to describe, such as the beam walking test and the grid test. So multiple motor coordination tests demonstrate the efficacy of the uh, ceruloplasmin replacement therapy in these mice. We looked in detail at the histological uh, uh, phenotype present in the, in the mice, particularly in the cerebellum. This is an example of the cerebellum. We also looked in other brain areas. 
And what we see is uh, microglial activation, dysfunction of astrocytes, and death on neurons. The death on neurons, I come from the neurodegeneration field, is one of the most difficult things to recover in uh, uh, models on neurodegeneration. We are actually able to observe a complete reversal of neuronal death in these mice, reduction of astrocytic dysfunction, and reduction of microglial activation. Okay, so just to, uh, I'm moving on towards the conclusion here. I think the unused proteome from, uh, or the, the proteome from unused or byproduct intermediates is potentially a, a, a useful source on novel therapies, particularly for rare diseases. This proteome includes proteins already on the market, but also new, obviously, potential candidate therapeutics. Uh, I think I demonstrated, we, it's not the only protein we are considering, this is just one example, there are other examples in that list that I showed you, but it's, uh, it's certainly possible to produce uh, uh, a candidate therapy, at least uh, efficacious in preclinical models, of uh, 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 a protein replacement therapy for a rare disease from these intermediates, and perhaps a systematic approach Cerebral as, I'll give you an example. Cerebral plasmin is uh, involved in our metabolism. In these uh, intermediates, we also find other proteins associated with our metabolism. So perhaps you know one can think of a, a family of products associated with a particular uh, uh, condition or a particular set of conditions associated with one mechanism which one can leverage. And I would like to conclude with acknowledgments. And this is going back to John's. Uh, point, or one of John's points at the beginning, the partnership between industry and academia, which was also uh, presented by the previous speakers, is, is key to the development of novel therapeutics, because we do not find all the expertise in a single site. We need to collaborate, to network, and I think, uh, hope, hopefully, I mean, the one message that I wanted to deliver today is how wonderfully complex the plasma that we work uh, on is. And, uh, and it is this complexity that made me defect from the small molecule drug discovery arena, which I was associated previously to the plasma field, because it's fascinating. And I thank you for your attention and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and we are well aware that we are running late, but I would like to invite our three speakers to join me up here, and we will take just a few um, general questions um, from uh, that these guys have been discussing. Um, there are a zillion detailed questions which we will have to leave for um, another time, I think. But if we may start, um, with a question that perhaps yeah, both Thomas and yeah, Todd can answer. Um, that, um, now that we're collecting plasma from around the world, increasingly international, and Thomas has talked about the fact that we are also importing internationally um, products, um, and these are from diverse origins, to what extent do you worry about the product safety or our understanding of product efficacy and what is happening with the spread of viral diseases, the IgG repertoires and our ability to respond to infection? So, so if I can maybe start, um, clearly I'm less concerned about the safety and the reason is we've spent the last two decades improving our manufacturing processes to the point where they can handle low levels of viral contaminants. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not like I'm not concerned about these. We have weekly meetings monitoring everything that goes on anywhere in the world because complacency is nothing that we can afford. But I think we are better at managing that versus understanding the other aspect. And, and there is complexities in that with SARS-CoV-2, we had so many other coronaviruses in circulation in humans that people were assuming there could be cross-protection, cross-reaction, and, and yes, there was cross-binding, but it was not cross-neutralizing. So that's, I think, where we need to focus more. Todd, would you like to comment? Yeah, so maybe a, a, a different thought. Um, beyond safety, maybe we should think about opportunities. 
And we can think of something like Ebola, Ebola outbreak in a very small region. What is the possibility of getting plasma from that region, getting it to a fractionation facility where you can make a new hyperimmune? And that's what Griffles did. We have a very small scale, it's called a multipurpose facility, but it's a clinical scale ability to take plasma from different regions of the world and very quickly generate a hyperimmune for it. So it could open up opportunities and it could open up opportunities for new infectious diseases that are challenging in different regions of the world. So are you saying that we can develop a platform processes which are unique or specific to specific hyperimmunes that you can transfer your knowledge from a COVID, yeah, IV, IG, hyperimmune development into other hyperimmunes as they develop? Yes. And what scale would you operate on? What was what? what scale can you operate on? Yeah, so that I think that is a key to be able to respond quickly. You have to be able to, because plasma, even with COVID, getting that plasma was very difficult to do. We had to have large plasma campaigns to get donors who have been infected, convalesced, to come in and donate. So the scale that we are operating at was very small, 100 donations. And then we can make GMP material at the small scale, and then we can scale it up as the plasma becomes more available. And... Andrea, to bring you into this discussion as well, um, you talked about uh, addressing neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and this has been challenging because of the blood-brain barrier and so on. What do you say is, or do you see a potential for plasma proteins in this particular area? Yes, absolutely, because uh, the, the most recent evidence in terms of uh, neurodegeneration, neurogenerative diseases, shows that there is com a com leakiness of the blood-brain barrier in neurodegenerative diseases. So uh, in these diseases, particularly in the uh, uh, middle to, to late stages of these diseases, you have uh, the ac more accessibility of uh, uh, plasma proteins to the brain. And in our case, for instance, we have shown that several plasmin can reach the brain in these mice by uh, two methods. One is uh, immunist chemistry, but the other one is by radio labeling uh, cellular plasmin and uh, tracing it back to the brain. So again, we have evidence of, 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 of a breakdown of the BBB in these mice. This is something that is also known in patients. And, uh, and therefore, a systemic treatment like the one that we apply to mm -hmm. these mice has a chance to deliver sufficient protein. You don't need to deliver vast quantities of proteins, sufficient quantity of the protein to actually change the course of the disease. So I have a, a question to all three of you too. What would you consider has been the biggest innovation in the industry to date? All the way back to perhaps 1890, or if you wish, from 1940 onwards. Thomas. Um, I, I, I think I'll, I shall see the obvious. Plasma has brought wonderful therapeutic advances, first with the treatment of hemophilia with Julie Paul's cryoprecipitate, then for immune deficiencies with the gamma global infractions, etc., etc. But it was all fraught with the problem of virus transmission. And therefore, fixing that and therefore making available the full therapeutic potential without the concern mm -hmm. associated with it, I think that has been the biggest step this industry has made. I would agree. Todd? So we heard this morning there were 130 million donations over the last five years. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever been into a facility, a plasma drive facility, and you looked at the industrial scale, you look at the automation, you look at their ability to process millions and millions of liters of plasma every year, high throughput, under the highest safety and quality standards, the engineering innovation, it's, it's incredible, it's fascinating. Yeah, I, I think it, I agree. It's absolutely stunning that we have come to this point where we build facilities which process millions of litres of plasma. Todd, I think you mentioned a six million litre facility. That's, if, I don't think even Cohn could have imagined that. Andrea. So, um I actually think that the, uh, uh, the leadership that the industry has demonstrated in terms of the viral inactivation, for instance, process towards biologics, which often steal the stage 
uh, also in, I think in the general public in terms of uh, therapeutics development. I think that is really, uh, 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 let's say, a mastery of, uh, of, uh, of uh, leadership and, uh, and demonstration that we have achieved a degree of uh, innovation which others are catching up with rather than us mm -hmm. following them. We had a, an interesting uh, set of figures um, earlier today saying that the industry spends of its cost burden about 9% uh, on R&D, whereas the chemical industry, the chemical and pharmaceutical industry spends 25%. Uh, I'm actually sure that biopharmaceutical industry spends an, a lot, a lot more. Do you think we should be increasing our expenditure on R&D? Well, that's... Uh, well, you're from R&D. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, the, and, the, yeah, so, yes. Where would we focus? Yeah. So, it, 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 absolutely, you know, more money in R&D, but what we're really focusing on, and you know, something that you spoke of, thousands of proteins, some people call this an old industry, or are we just scratching the surface? We need a better balance the protein utilization per liter of plasma, and with that will come more R&D funding. Thomas, do you have a comment? I, I, I certainly do, and I think Andrea framed it really nicely, in that if we would identify a single protein that is therapeutically of value, then that could easily be replaced by a recombinant alternative, like we've seen it in the mm -hmm. factory landscape and what have you. But I think where we have a gamish potentially of post-translational modifications that afford this gamish a unique therapeutic value, then that cannot be replaced by recombinant technologies and therefore that could be new entities that we could provide out of an already paid for resource, if you will. So that would certainly be of interest. And I think that's a rather good yeah, final statement, actually, that we have such a plethora of proteins in our plasma, this proteome is unexplored to a very large extent. Um, and we are often, as I said, talking about albumin or IgG or C1 esterase inhibitor as though they are a pharmaceutical product. They are not pharmaceutical products. And I think the more that we put into R&D, the more we will get out in new proteins for the treatment of rare diseases and potentially diseases which affect many. That we don't know yet. So I'm looking forward to lots of innovation and I'm also looking forward to a drink later. And thank you very much to our speakers. We are terribly sorry to be a little bit late. And please don't go away because there is an award to be made. And thank you, gentlemen, if you would like to leave the stage. Um, Evelina or okay <laughs> oh wow what a nice momentum now so ladies and gentlemen friends and colleagues actually I have to admit that one of the great privilege to be the chairman of the board of the European PPTA board is that as every other year I can come on the stage and share this award with all of you, right? And that's, uh, but this time, almost I would say unanimously, this award came to, uh, uh, I think, an unquestionable globally recognized expert in safety, in pathogens and viral safety, right? Is a, is a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Vienna, Austria is an associate professor of virology and medical university in Vienna, is a VP global pathogen safety at Takeda and as a chairperson of a viral safety working group and pathogen safety steering committee. Uh, colleagues, so please join me and congratulate Thomas Cray for the infamous award. Thanks, Thomas. Well, thank you so much. Well, first, thank you. Um, so.
typically I'm not a shy person on stage, but, but I will say this is really rather overwhelming. Um, when I got notified of that award, um, I saw a list of the people who got it before me. And to be honest, I was not of the opinion that my Vita would match theirs. It's really people who have done so great things, uh, many of them in the clinical research around plasma proteins, really, really, I'm not sure that that is shoes I will be able to fill. Um, and then I did some research, obviously, on, on the award. I mean, Joachim Hilfenhaus, I've never met him personally, but uh, my friend Johannes Blümel from the Paul Ehrlich Institute, he met him and he said he, the guy was a legend. He was uh, the first chair of the Viral Safety Working Group. Uh, at that stage, it was still called EAPPI, the European Association of Plasma Products Industry. At that stage, Europe was more the center of plasma than it is now. I'll come to that. <laughs> And, um, and he was the first chairman of that uh, group. So that group uh, has later been renamed into the Pathogen Safety Working Group and now the Global Pathogen Safety Working Group because we didn't work on viruses only, quote unquote, but prions, so pathogens. And, and I'm very privileged to still work with that group for more than 15 years now. So I, I, I have um, something nominated or, or dedicated to my predecessor, if you will, in my hands. So not only has it changed from viral safety to pathogen safety, but also has changed from EA, PPA, I, and a couple of more iterations to what is now PPTA, and, and that's a much more US-centric organization. So it comes back to that balance of plasma supply that I think we all need to strive for, collaborate just to make sure there is more. Um, I did also read up what the requirements were for uh, somebody to be awarded uh, this wonderful Thank you again. This wonderful price. Uh, it had to be special um, um, contributions to the safety and efficacy of plasma derivatives. Now, safety, that is something I spent my last 25 years working on. And, and so I, I, I think that envelope I can match in some ways. On the efficacy, I think it's really quite fitting that we have had this session here because the efficacy of plasma derivatives is something we need to all work more on, particularly with a more global supply, the efficacy profiles will change. And so that is something that we're going to remain very active in. Um, and then what I wanted to say is, I have the privilege of having this in my hands. But, but in reality, I think this is dedicated to many people who have collaborated uh, in the Viral Safety Working Group, the Pathogen Safety Steering Committee, the Global Pathogen Safety Working Group over the years. All very passionate people, really deep expertise, willing to step up every time there was a challenge, like variant CJD, a prion disease, nothing like a virus ever. And it was really lots of work that we had to do, but equally these were people very enjoyable to work with. So actually a big thank you to all my colleagues really. So just some logistics, so don't forget that we wait, the bus is waiting 6.30 from the lobby and we will departure for the ceremony at the dinner tonight, so thank you.